G'day and welcome back to Indefensible New Zealand. Today, sacred cows and how to slaughter them best in the Defence Force. Uh, that might seem like an unusual approach to rebuilding the Defence Force, but um, I, I stick, stick with it and uh, I think uh, you'll find that there's some ideas that, which are worth exploring. The Defence Force has a lot of problems, but it has a lot of good people. Unfortunately, it doesn't have enough good people. And that's uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, uh, even the defence structure that we had, or have, lacks the mass and the lethality and the sustainability to do the tasks that the New Zealand government expects of it now, and in the future in an increasingly unstable uh, strategic environment. Now let's look at the actuality rather than the structure on paper. The NZDF has a recruitment problem, it has a retention problem, it has a morale problem, and it has a mental health problem which extends well beyond those in uniform for veterans and their families. You can't design a system to, to solve what are essentially people problems. And yet, the approaches that are being taken at the moment are largely systemic in nature. So, is it a disaster? Well, it's a disaster in the, in the waiting, I think. And um, if disasters are a... Um, an ideal laboratory for the study of change, then we should be using this opportunity where the NZDF has got so many problems to try and solve that don't relate to buying hardware, that um, why not take some risks? But to do that, you know, the old saying that uh, in order to get a new idea into the mind of the military, um, the hardest thing is actually getting the old one out because the people that are largely left in the Defence Force now have a vested interest in the way things are, not the way they could be. So what are these, these uh, sacred cows? What sorts of things could we uh, take a look at? At the moment, the Defence Force is close to a Carter Force, and by that I mean it can, it's got enough capacity to train itself, uh, to train some other forces members, uh, for instance the uh, army is doing with Ukrainian troops in the UK and previously we've seen that in Iraq. Uh, we see that also in the Navy uh, at the moment and uh, cooperation with other forces. So very small groups doing essentially training or monitoring um, UN observation roles and the like. There is almost no combat power available on call now in a sustainable fashion that the government can use. Let's just accept that for what it is. You might be able to cobble together a one-shot rifle company and maybe re replace it once. And that's it. Well below the, the uh, purchase agreement that currently exists. So, we have an immediate problem. Space in the ranks. And it's just crazy to think that we can just change a few things about recruitment or maybe hope that uh, the, you know, widespread layoffs that are happening across the uh, the country at the moment will somehow result in longer recruitment queues because you're still talking years to turn those applicants into useful soldiers and officers and sailors and aviators. We have a need now. So how could we fill that? Firstly, let's look at the available options. Many, many countries in the world now operate private military companies. Yeah, I know, you're going to say mercenaries, we can't have mercenaries, but that's that's not what I'm talking about. Mercenaries are quite a different thing again. And private military companies are a viable option to consider because we've got a lot of already trained soldiers, aviators, sailors out there who probably would, for the premium available in that sort of an environment, work for a contractor who could work for the NZDF and do some of these, these ready, uh, ready tasks, the on-call tasks. Now, why would the private military company be more efficient? Well, simply because all it would have to do is train for war. And if you compare that with what, say, a rifle company commander in the New Zealand Army today does, that would be an enormous point of leverage. Take away, uh, if you take away the parades and the compliance with internal regulations and all the things that, uh, you know, the openings of Parliament and the guarding of MRQ facilities and all the things that the government or the Army causes itself to do, PMCs don't have to do that. They don't open Parliament, they don't guard anything, they don't have to go and clean up after civil defence, they just train for war and they're always available as per their contract. So let's not discount that and and while doing that, let's actually say well, how can the remaining people that we've got, how can we make better use of them? Well, by not having them open Parliament and responding to civil defence etc etc events is, is part of that. 
And so I'm a, fa I'm a great fan of, um, for instance, independent companies. And that goes with a general theme of reducing the number of headquarters that we've got. If you have a headquarters, the headquarters generates activity. And with that activity brings a loss of efficiency in the subunit that it commands. Commanders are going to command. So if you've got a battalion and four or five companies, that command headquarters, say that battalion headquarters, is going to generate activity for those companies, which has nothing much to do with what the company commander wants to do to prepare their, their troops for their roles in, in war which at the end of the day is what the Defence Force exists for, to fight the nation's wars. Are there other organisations that could take on a lot of this? Of course there are. And uh, there's some good work going on in the civil defence and emergency management space and, um, and uh, veteran organisations uh, like uh, Task Force Kiwi and so on and so forth. So I won't go that into, into that in too much more detail other than to say we are too small to be mucking around with the number of headquarters we've got right at the moment. It's easy to create things and really hard to get rid of them again. Sacred cow number one, get rid of TRADOC, have everything report to the brigade headquarters in the army and take similar steps in the uh, Navy and Air Force. Um, and we need to um, reduce the number of uh, reporting lines that actually occur. So you've got Raise, train and sustain models in Navy, Army and Air Force, all reporting to their single service chiefs. And then you've got um, the joint function of you know deploy and support and, and recover. But the overlap, well, and the, the, the number of ranks that are involved in that, senior ranks, really expensive uh, people to hold who really, um, well, you know what I'm going to say. We could do with a uh, few of them. So while we're talking about headquarters and independence and getting people more focused on training for war fighting and less focused on um, being a disciplined labour force, let's talk about ranks. We've basically got the old British Army rank structure. The uh, Navy has the old Royal Navy rank structure and the Air Force sort of cobbled together a bit from both. Is it fit for purpose? Well, no. And there's several reasons for that. And Nicholas Drummond has written some great articles on it. I wrote an article on it too. I was inspired by Nicholas's uh, pieces. We are no longer a heavily stratified society. We are no longer in a situation where only officers have higher education. Heaps of uh, people other than officers who have master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, wandering around in, uh, in uniform. Um, we have great uh, communications so it's not a matter of having to have m multiple layers for passing information down we have better situational awareness S individuals teams um, have massive lethality and fantastic situ situational awareness and there's just a general change in society away from stratification and more to towards um, i wouldn't say egalitarian because i'm not sure that egalitarian works very well on the battlefield but away from over an overly stratified system so have we got some orphan ranks? Oh yeah. So for instance, the Army has a Lance Corporal, the Air Force has a leading aircraftsman, and the Navy has a, um, a leading seaman, oh, sorry, a able-bodied seaman. But the latter two are, um, are not ranks. And you could argue that the Lance Corporal administers the section and it's gonna be there in case the Corporal is killed. Well, yeah, so could a senior private. Um, we used to have large sergeants, they were corporals who were step up to replace a missing platoon sergeant. All these problems have been worked through before. With the exception of in the stores system, staff sergeants, for instance, are uh, basically, well, what do they do? Most of them pop up in training roles. But why not let them actually be platoon commanders, like a colour sergeant model? We haven't got enough junior officers. And uh, two ranks of war and officer. Well, um, Major General Morris Dodson tried to do away with the way two rank. Everyone weighted him out and put, brought it back again. We don't need we don't need this highly stratified um, cluster of, of war and officers, technical and generalist. A bigger question is why do we call NCOs NCOs? Now I know because of history. So we had commissioned officers who have um, a commission from the crown, and they, that comes with legal rights to command. But I'm really against defining things by what they are not. And you, you'll know if you've followed any of my reading that I've had a lot to say about the old term. We used to be non-regular force to, to talk about the TF, the reserves. And I'm of the same view with non-commissioned officers. Surely they're, they're, I mean, they're an absolute important, vital um, component in running the Defence Force. 
So I like to find them by the fact that they're, oh, they're just not commissioned officers. There's heaps of uh, those people, you know, sergeants through to Warrenosic walking around with higher degrees. And yet, they are given an official title which somehow sets them up, sets them below. I know some countries have what they call under officers and, and various other terms. I don't really mind what term to come up. Hey, we could come up with a Tao Māori name for them uh, to to understand the that cluster, um, which means something like the, the leader of warriors or whatever. I don't care. Let's just not define them by what they're not, because to be honest, the commissioned officers uh, have a role to play, and it's an important role. But so too do the people in the um, the corporal through to warrant officers uh, category, who um, run run the units and subunits day to day, who do most of the training um, and um, who uh, in many ways maintain the passage of the culture baton from generation to generation, sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. So ranks, uh, yep, we need to actually stop and think, do we really, really need, and, and while we're on to our Māori too, um, privates, drivers, aircrafts, well, aviator now, um, and and the like, ordinary seamen. Why not just call them all toa, warriors? Is it a, a uniquely um, New Zealand title? Uh, I've seen in the Irish and also in the Canadian Armed Forces bilingual rank systems, bilingual drill systems. I was stunned watching the changing of the guard in um, in Ottawa a few years ago uh, when I was up at Staff College there and. Um, the, um, all the foot commands were given in English, all the rifle commands were given in French and uh, it was very impressive and I think we can go a lot further in terms of integrating some of these things. Would that make a difference to the problems that the NZDF have? We've got to create a structure and a culture go in the future to go forward to, not just try and work our way out of the problems to go back to what we have and so yes I, I think it does because it's going to open, broaden appeal to uh, a wider range of um, potential su uh, service personnel. And while we're talking about um, people, and particularly about um, particularly about retention, it's unrealistic, I think, to assume that everyone will join and progress through a nice orderly chain of courses and experiences to the end of their career. That's simply not true. We've known that for years. So why offer standard engagements? Let's be uh, looking at the average turnover, and I think it's around about six years, people think, oh, well, while I'm young and I'm single and I'm quite fit, I'll go and do this exciting stuff. Uh, and then they meet a partner or they have a kid or they've, they've done the exciting stuff and they can tick that off the list and they want to go and do um, something else. Short-term, fixed-term contracts, three, six years. You only invest what you need to get them in there. Incentivize them uh, both financially and in other ways to re-enlist. Pick and choose. There's not everyone who joins it. 19 is re is going to be suitable to keep around for 20 years but you sign up for that as a, as a system when they join unless they do something really really dumb you can't get rid of them so let's be selective and i think also we've got to, we've got to be more broad-minded about how we bring people into the system we're all we've already got a reasonably well established specialist officer strand but it only tends to be for people who are already professionally qualified like um, lawyers, doctors, nurses and the like. I'd like to see that introduced into other ranks areas and I see absolutely no reason why a specialist, I'm going to say it NCO, a specialist entry uh, at that level from corporal to warren officer couldn't be introduced so that um, they have a specific trade speciality, a stream, um, and that's that's what they're hired to to excel in. Now you're always going to need your your generalist go through to the end kind of people, but I, I just see that a lot of people who are highly mobile become dissatisfied and leave, and the ones who aren't so highly mobile stay, and that's not ideal for the organisation. Now if we're getting rid of headquarters, we need to actually have an honest conversation about what's happening in the Warren Austin Class One ranks at the moment uh, in Warren Austin across the board with the. Uh, proliferation I would call it of command warrant officers I'm just going to be blunt and say it there's too many and they um, they're not simply not I don't believe most of them are justified and look in my view if a commanding officer needs a um, 25 to 30 year buddy to tell him what the soldiers are thinking he should be removed as the commanding officer the idea of being the 
the commanding officer's advisor or the troops. It worked quite well when the commanding officer didn't deign to talk to the troops, but goodness me, there's so many problems being talked about behind closed doors about this, uh, the, what's happening in the command warrant officer space. But very few people honest enough to just come out and say WTF. <laughs> so I'm saying it, WTF. Oh, certainly we need to have an open conversation and officers stop whinging behind closed doors and actually come out and sit, sit, sit these warrant officers down and go through what's working and what's not and what your expectations are. Are you in command of the Defence Force or would you like the CDF to be a command warrant officer? Because that can happen if you just change the, if the politicians just change the law. One stroke of a pen from appoint an officer to appoint any member of the force. Um, let's just uh, move away from the problems of finding people. I've talked a lot about voluntary national service and I think that that's uh, a no-brainer. Um, basically coordinated self-interest, encourage people to join, give them something in return other than their salary and that could be you know no student debt on your on your um, degree or your trade qualification. Uh, we went some way towards doing that with the old loan scheme, the original one which I designed and um, it's been removed and changed into something else. It largely favours the Carter Force. We have too many things going on in defence and really uh, a process of simplification is the only way that the minister or ministers in, in the case at the moment can really try and break out of this um, inertia that Defence Force is in because I know what's going to happen, we're going to have service chiefs change very very soon and then there'll be a few new ideas but largely they'll be about trying to recover put a couple of new shiny things in over here and try and recover the space that is vacant over on the other side. Any suggestion that anything radical has to change will be struck with the organisational disobedience which defense, the Defence Force is renowned for where people will just sit on their hands and wait it out as they did with General, General Dodson. And that can't happen because people are going to die in large numbers and I just want the New Zealand public to think about that company three quarters decimated and war is not unusual in, in uh, total war, are you ready to see 70 or 80 body bags come back to New Zealand at one time? And the answer is no. What can we do about it? Well, let's actually prepare them better, protect them, project them and sustain them better and that requires money. It also requires changes to the way the Defence Force does things. The Defence Estate does not need to be owned by Defence. I've written about this several times, billions of dollars of land and buildings that could be owned by the government, NZ Inc, anyone, don't care, and so managed by them and leased to the Defence Force. That's a whole bunch of people, they don't need to look after it, and a whole bunch of accrual, uh, of uh, accrual accounting, so capital charge for instance, um, needed to, and just maintenance and etc etc. NZDF is in the business of war fighting, not in the business of maintaining large chunks of real estate and the sooner we get that put into effect, the better. And look, there are microcosms of examples around already, the iwi leasing um, base areas to people. But fundamentally, it's not a core business and if it's not a core business, shouldn't be doing it. If it is potentially a core business or useful, but it's not for us, so for instance, Air Force flying for police, full costing. Bill everyone, dock police, search and rescue, for the actual real cost of operating the defence machine. And I, I just mentioned capital charge and depreciation. This is the only country, as far as I'm aware, certainly in the West, that taxes itself for using its own money. Just think about that. I've got money and I tax myself for using it, and for doing something that I want to have done. So, uh, let's say that um, the capital charge was 10% that's high but and I give you a million dollars you've got to give me 10% of it back because that's the cost of using the money but you are, you are me and I am you the government is the defense force and the defense force is the government this is crazy and depreciation okay here's a whole lot of uh, new shiny new aircraft or shiny new ships or, or tanks or whatever now we're going to work out an arbitrary sort of rate of depreciation for these based on presumably straight line depreciation over the projected life of the the platform and we're going to take that back off you every year, just like, you know, depreciating your, depreciating your tools if you're a tradie. And it goes into depreciation account. Now, this is a really good idea in theory because it means that Defence has got a little stash of cash that it can use to buy replacements. But hold on. Defence isn't allowed to use that depreciation account without going to the Minister and Cabinet anyway. And the other bite is that... Um, 
everything in defense costs more when you replace it so the the vehicle that cost you know a million dollars to replace it is going to be one and a half to two million dollars so your depreciation is never going to really cover the cost of replacing the kit now i know that's that's the same with many different professions but what do we what do we have a defense force for fighting wars wars require hardware if you don't want people to fight wars just disband the defense force but don't have them structured uh, legally financially regulatory sense with one arm tied behind their back so there's there's got to be a whole lot of change and it's got to come from both directions it's got to come from the politicians and from parliament changing some of the rules and it's got to come from politicians giving the defense chiefs very very clear guidance that we're not going back we're not going back to the future we're going forward to the future and what defense force would you build if you really were looking at the, um, the situation that you currently have in the world and let's face it the whole world's going to hell in hand cart at the moment you wouldn't build the defense force you've got we lack all sorts of things from um, air defense to logistic sustainability the ability to project our troops even into the south pacific and sustain them there um, we, we lack mass uh, we lack lethality we lack sustainability and and then we have massive recruitment retention morale and mental health problems it is a disaster how many defense chiefs have been sacked none look around the world when someone screws up they're gone the americans are like probably the pack leaders on it but no one survives not delivering on their aims so if i was the minister i would be saying to the chief of the defense force these are the metrics that i will measure your performance by and that those are the metrics that i on which i'll decide whether you are relieved of command or not now i know people will jump and say oh well legally this and that and the public service will hold it because the defense force isn't part of the public service neither is the police uh, they're completely independent by law and so they uh, basically have a warrant from the crown exercised through the minister now while we're on warrants let's get rid of a few single service chiefs don't need a warrant what that is enabling is institutional disobedience it means that they can ignore an order from the cdf and the cdf can't sack them because they have a crown warrant only the um, minister or the governor general acting on the advice of the government can sack them when has that happened um, never that i can remember certainly not in recent history of you know, 30 or 40 years and yet there have been many examples of people who have been blatantly organizationally disruptive and um, and uh, disobedient in that that uh, two star in those two star roles and they've just basically steered it down and that's if this government really is serious about wanting change they need to make some structural change and there's a bill been languishing on the order paper since jonathan coleman was um, defense minister you know nearly 10 years ago which actually addressed a whole lot of these things which has been fiddled with and it's the classic organizational disobedience thing been fiddled with and chipped away at and waiting waiting out certain moods of government so uh, to the minister judith collins uh, to the associate minister chris pink uh, good luck you're going to have to be uh, pretty hard uh, if you want to see it if you want to leave your roles and be able to look back and say the defense force is so much better than not only the one that i inherited but the one that we've tolerated for the last 10 15 years nearly because all these issues were identified back the white paper that began in 2009 and here we are still mucking around celebrating that a new c-130 is just being test flown and got some poseidons and oh, what are we going to do about the ships and by the way there's no one to sail them no one to um, fly uh, a whole lot of our aircraft and um how many soldiers did you say you want? Hmm. No, we can't do that many, but we could do half that. So everyone's got to step up. This is only going to really change when you've got a, a couple, a minister and a CDF of one mind and willing to drive through change. And that, that's going to mean there's going to be some sacred cows have to be slaughtered along the way. That's probably enough for now. As you can see, it's if you've been in New Zealand, you'll know it's been pouring with rain for the last several days. And as you can see, the, the marina water is filthy. We've got a whole lot of trees and logs slash, thank, thank you foresters, uh, floating around the boats. And um, But it's finally stopped and 
it's uh, got a little bit glary and it's clearing up so if you've got a question for the podcast please send it in to me uh, you can uh, find me through the unclass.com website through the contacts page there and I'll be happy to answer your questions that's all for now be careful out there